suffering at the hands of Rome, cause they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. My name's Tom Frass, host of Inquisition Update, and uh, you're listening to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio, and Walt has asked me to come continue our reading and discussion of the book Romanism and the Reformation from the Standpoint of Prophecy by Henry Grattan Guinness. And last Sunday, we concluded on page 339 of the book, so if you're following along in the online version from the University of Toronto, we will uh, retreat, as is my custom, for continuity purposes. We'll retreat back to the beginning of the paragraph we were reading and then uh, continue our discussion. Now remember, we were talking about the New Testament predictions of the Protestant Reformation. That's right, God gives clues to the Protestant Reformation even in the New Testament. Okay, this was a move of the Holy Spirit. It was a move away from Antichrist, away from the Roman Catholic Church, and toward Christ. All right, the truth. Remember, the scriptures had been hidden throughout all the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church had a lock on the Scriptures. First of all, the Scriptures that the Roman Catholic Church kept to itself was written in Latin that the people could not read and understand for themselves. And then that Latin version of the Scriptures uh, and all other versions were outlawed and burned by the Roman Catholic Church, that Latin version of the scriptures was kept by the priests and, uh, and only given out by special permission of the Roman Catholic hierarchy to up-and-coming priests. So that's what made the Dark Ages the Dark Ages. The light of the gospel was not possessed by the people. It was possessed only by the, the priests and the prelates of the Roman Catholic Church. And they simply lied to the people about what the scriptures say in order to support the idea that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and that by divine right, he should not only rule over the spiritual things of the people, but also over the temporal things, that the Pope had power to seat and unseat the kings and the governments of, of all of quote-unquote Christendom, and that if any uh, king or queen or potentate or president 
defied the direct orders of the papacy, the papacy could overthrow that government and seat one that would obey him. In, in, in effect, taking the throne of Almighty God on the earth. And as soon as the scriptures were translated by Martin Luther and the other Protestant reformers, and as soon as those Bibles landed in the hands of the people, and for the first time for nearly a thousand years, the people themselves were allowed to read the scriptures in their own language and understand for the first time in their life what Christ had to say to his people. They immediately shook off the pretenses of the papacy. They stripped from him both his spiritual power and his temporal power. And they liberated themselves from the governments over which the papacy ruled them. And they elected their own governments. And they wrote their own constitutions. And they put Christ on his rightful throne and obeyed the scriptures. The civil laws of the land became beneficial to the people, not the Pope. And the laws of the lands preserved the rights, the God-given rights to the people, where the papacy before that time had denied the people any rights. This is why it was called the Dark Ages. It was the Protestant Reformation, the light of Christ that exposed the darkness of the Dark Ages, exposed the darkness of the papacy, exposed the darkness of the papal, king, the papal kingdoms over which the Pope ruled. Tremendous upheaval at the time of the Protestant Reformation. World-changing upheaval. And it was all because of the Scriptures. It was all because for the first time in nearly a thousand years, Christ's voice was heard. Now, with that preface, we'll begin our discussion on page 338 at the middle of the page. Quote, the Reformation, which commenced with the struggles of a humble soul in the cell of a convent in Erfurt, has never ceased to advance. An obscure individual with the word of life in his hand had stood erect in presence of worldly grandeur and made it tremble. This word he had opposed first to Tetzel, the one who was selling indulgences, remember, and his numerous hosts. And these avaricious merchants, after a momentary resistance, had taken flight. Next, he opposed it to the legate of Rome at Augsburg. And the legate, paralyzed, had allowed his prey to escape. At a later period, he had opposed it to the champions of learning in the halls of Leipzig, the University of Leipzig. And the astonished theologians had seen their syllogistic weapons broken to pieces in their hands. You see what effect, what early effects Martin Luther's translation of the scripture had? It began the work of Reformation almost immediately. Continuing, he says, at last he had opposed it to the Pope, who disturbed in his sleep had risen up upon his throne and thundered at the troublesome monk. But the whole power of the head of Christendom, this word had paralyzed. I'm going to stop and make a comment. If you agree with me that the papacy is the Antichrist, if you believe with me and the Protestant reformers that the papacy is the Antichrist, if, if after listening to me and others who are preaching about this, if you agree with us, that the new world order is simply the old world order of the popes restored, 
And if you, like me, are looking to reverse this new world order, just like Martin Luther reversed the old world order, then this word will have the same effect today that it had then. It will paralyze it. The truth of the word of God will paralyze this new world order. And literally, we understand now why the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual. In other words, scriptural. For the for the casting down of principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. And who are they? The Antichrist and his minions. And the governments of the world that once liberated by the Protestant Reformation have now grown to serve the papacy again and not the people. You want to stop this new world order? It's only by the scriptures that one can do it. Again, he says, at last, speaking of Martin Luther, he had opposed it to the Pope. In other words, he had opposed the Pope by the Scriptures. He says, at last, he had opposed it to the Pope, who, disturbed in his sleep, had risen up upon his throne and thundered at the troublesome monk. But the whole the whole power of the head of Christendom, that is the Pope and all of his hierarchy, this word, the Bible, had paralyzed. The word had still a last struggle to maintain. It behooved to triumph over the emperor of the West, over the kings and over the princes of the earth, and then, victorious over all, the powers of the world, they take its place in the church to reign in it as the pure word of God, unquote. And this phrase, this lengthy quote, was taken from another marvelous Protestant work by Merle de Bigny entitled The History of the, of the Reformation, Volume 2, page 129. So, this gospel now translated into the language of the people, not only opposed the Pope, but it opposed the governments of of the world. It says it even behooved to triumph over the emperor of the West, the Western Empire, the emperor of the Western, uh, Western Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, is what I'm saying. And over the kings and princes of the earth, and then victorious over all the powers of the world take its place in the church to reign in it as the pure word of God, unquote. So the gospel overthrew the entire governmental structure of the world. First, it lopped off its diabolical head, the papacy. No more spiritual power, no more, no more temporal power, you are nobody. It's Satan who gives you his power and seat and great authority. You have no authority over the house of God. Neither do you have the authority to seat and unseat the kings of the earth that rule over us. They are God's servants, not yours. And since they would not repent of their service to the papacy, the people overthrew them. The truth, the gospel overthrew those governments. You remember reading in one place where the gospel was overturning the world, turning the world on its head. Well, Rome had shut out that gospel. And Martin Luther and other of the Protestant reformers from Tyndale, Zwingli, all of them, used that sword of the Spirit again to bring light to the Catholic world, to the to the Catholic Europe. It can be done again today. It's already been demonstrated in history how the papacy and his minions can be put to flight. 
We have that spiritual weapon in our hands. That's what Martin Luther is trying to tell us. But what is happening in Christendom today? They are refusing this gospel. And they are, once again, reuniting with the papacy and elevating the papacy to the head of all Christendom. They've restored to him both his spiritual power and his temporal power, and now we are made slaves once again to the papacy. We're finding out by example daily how they had to live in the old world order, in the dark ages. And what is the consequence? What is the eventual consequence of this new world order? To completely silence the gospel and gospel preaching. That's what the papacy has in store, to silence that gospel that finally inflicted the mortal wound on the beast, to silence that gospel and then to restore the order that the Pope enjoyed prior to the Protestant Reformation, restoring to himself both his spiritual power and his temporal power and then reorganizing the governments of the world to serve him and oppress the people. Do you feel oppressed today? History is simply repeating itself. This isn't rocket science. This isn't brain surgery. This is basic elementary Christendom, Christianity. This is history repeating itself. It shouldn't surprise anybody. It shouldn't perplex anybody. It should just be a recipe for victory. We've already seen how the Protestant reformers overthrew the old world order. Shall we, in our generation now, seeing the history of this old world order, shall we now, once the Protestants have have shown us perfectly how to overthrow that that old world order, should we now sit and wring our hands at what to do about the new world order? Well, I'm not much of a hand wringer. I'm a fighter. I'm a doer. And I'm a Protestant reformer. I know the papacy is the Antichrist. I know he now controls the governments of the world, including the United States and the government. And no, what, no government more so than he controls the government of the United States. And that's why I'm reading this book. This history, restoring this history to your Protestant mind so that you leave the ecumenical movement and return to the protest. The protest is not over. For America, the protest might be just beginning. But it's up to us. If we will fight for Christ, he will strengthen us. If we go along with this new world order, if we go along kowtowing to the papacy, if we kowtow to this ecumenical movement, then fate is going to have her way. Are we going to do like the Israelites, bow the knee to Baal, and then be cast aside, cast off into the Babylonian captivity? We've already tasted our liberty. Shall we return to Babylon? Or should we go on to Christ? The answer is obvious. But the flesh is weak, isn't it? He continues in the middle of page 339. Quote, Let us believe the gospel. Let us believe St. Paul and not the letters and decretals of the Pope. Unquote. Luther was wont to say. Quoting further, he says, Are you the man that undertakes to reform the papacy, said an officer to him one day? Yes, replied Luther, I am the man. I confide confide in almighty God, whose word I have before me. Sooner sacrifice my body and my life. Better to allow my arms and legs to be cut off, said he to the archbishop who tried to persuade him to retract his writings, quote, then abandon the clear and genuine word of God. Martin Luther said, yes, I'm the man. 
I'm going to deliver God's people from the oppressor in Rome. Whether the gospel is going to be do it, is going to do it. And it would be better for my arms and legs to be cut off, my body to be dismembered, than to abandon the clear and genuine word of God. Martin Luther was dead set in his mission to oppose Antichrist and thereby stand for Christ. That's our mission. Our mission today is the same one that Martin Luther welcomed. And there would be no ecumenical movement for Martin Luther. There would be no uniting once again with the Roman Catholic Church. There would be no more popes in the life of Martin Luther. No more sacrificing priests in the life of Luther. There would only be the scriptures and the scriptures alone, faith and faith alone, in Christ and Christ alone, and only preaching the gospel for the rest of his life. And because he took that position, he liberated all of Europe from the papacy, put the jack back in the box, and put the light of Christ all over Europe. Would to God that history would repeat itself in that form rather than to have this papal new world order roll over us like a steam locomotive. He says, continue at the bottom of page 339. From his lonely Patmos-like prison in the castle of Wartburg, now, here's a, a literary likeness between Martin Luther and John the Revelator. I don't want you to miss this. He says, from his lonely Patmos-like prison in the castle of Wartburg, in the forests of Thuringia in Germany, Luther gave his priceless treasure, the word of God, to the country in a translation which is still in use in Germany. He felt that the Bible which had liberated him could alone liberate his people. Quote, it was necessary that a mighty hand should throw back the ponderous gates of that arsenal of the word of God in which Luther himself had found his armor, and that those vaults and ancient halls which no foot had traversed for ages should be again opened to the Christian people for the day of battle, unquote. Quoting again, it says, let this single book, he exclaims, be in all tongues, in all lands, before all eyes, in all ears, in all hearts. And again, the scripture, without any commentary, is the sun from which all teachers must receive light, unquote. And not Luther only, but all the reformers, like the apostles before them, held up the word of God alone for light, just as they held up the sacrifice of Christ alone for salvation. They gave to the world the book which Christ had given to them, which they had found sweet to their souls, though it subsequently brought on them bitter trouble. It was an established principle of the Protestant Reformation to reject nothing but what was opposed to quote, some clear and formal declaration of the Holy Scriptures, unquote. Now, I don't want to dwell on this, but I need to make a point at this, at this stage. Early in the Protestant Reformation, they were all being reformed. They were all on the learning curve. They were all coming out of Roman Catholicism and into the light of the gospel. And so it was a process, and they developed an early strategy. Since the gospel was relatively new to them, they didn't have the full revelation of the scriptures yet. They were learning. And so they took the early position in their discussions of the Word of God 
to reject nothing but what was directly opposed in the scriptures. All right? New doctrines were coming out. The true gospel of Jesus Christ was coming out. The true teachings of scripture, how to be a true follower of Jesus Christ was first becoming known to them. And they knew there had to be a tremendous reform in their lives because they had been living in the darkness, been living under the lies of the papacy and the priests. So they had a lot of riddles to unfold. They had a lot of correction to make in their lives, in their spiritual and physical lives. And their initial, their initial plan of operations was to reject nothing except that which the Scripture specifically opposes. All right, this means immediately they throw out the sacrificing priest. There's no such thing in the Bible. They throw out the Pope. There's no such thing in the Bible. They throw out the Mass. There's no such thing in the Bible. And you can see where this is going, right? This transformation from Roman Catholicism to true Bible Christianity. But, and I will gently, as I can, try to suggest to you that they didn't go far enough. They didn't find any direct, concrete, clear, and formal declaration against the most unbiblical traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. That is Sunday worship, the worship of God, or rather Sabbath, they call it, to be held on the first day of the week and not the seventh. That is clearly a violation of Scripture. There's not one word in all the Bible from Genesis to Revelation announcing a change of the Sabbath. Did God get it wrong the first time and had to change it? Is he a man that he should err? No. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But Rome, rather Constantine the Great, the Caesar of the pagan Roman Empire that adopted Christianity as a matter of expedience in order to save the fall of the Roman Empire, since Christianity was overthrowing everything, in an attempt to restore or to maintain the Roman Empire, he, as a political measure, had to accept Christianity. And to maintain his throne as the Caesar, he had to begin to change Christianity's laws. In other words, to usurp the throne or to become the head of Christendom, he had to demonstrate some power or some prerogative that would put him in that place, in that antichrist place. And so he thought to change times and laws of Christianity. And in 328 AD, he made a proclamation transferring the solemnity of the, of the biblical Sabbath to Sunday. It's in the official records of Rome, of the Roman Empire. They're still extant. They still have this decree of 328 A.D. by Constantine transferring without biblical authority, usurping Christ's throne, Constantine changes the solemnity of the seventh day and puts it on the first day of the week. I am Caesar. I have spoken. And, of course, uh, the bishops of Rome, which wanted to exalt their throne above the stars of God, just like Caesar did, kept and maintained that, quote-unquote, tradition, Sunday, Sabbath. It's not written in the Scripture It's not even predicted in the Scripture. There's no direct prohibition, but common sense says that once God opens his mouth and decrees a decree and makes something holy, and by the way, only he can make something holy, for only he is holy. 
And that begs the recognition that if Sabbath is holy, if the seventh day is holy, because God decreed it and made it holy, can man change it? Can man make it unholy and transfer the holiness from one day to another? Can sinful fallen man transfer the solemnity of God's holy Sabbath, the seventh day, to the first day of the week? No. But obviously, the Protestant reformers couldn't find any formal, clear declaration in the Holy Scriptures forbidding Sabbath on the first day of the week. Do we need to be told by some quote-unquote spiritual authority being dressed in the flesh of a sinful fallen man, do we need any direction from anybody what day the Sabbath is? I don't. I don't need any instruction about what the Sabbath day is or how it should be observed. It's all in the Scriptures. After all, I am a Protestant. Scripture alone. Man's traditions are fallible. They are to be rejected. The Pope is a mere man and a diabolical man serving Satan and not God. And I reject his Sunday Sabbath. And I seek to obey God in the Scriptures. And we ought all to take good stock in the Sunday Sabbath to see whether it is of God. Search the Scriptures. Test the spirits. And if you can find one word authorizing a change of Sabbath from the seventh day to the first, please email me, will you? Tom at seawaves.us. That's Tom at seawaves.us. I I intend, and I have long ago, returned to the true Sabbath of Almighty God, and it's a day of rest, not a day of obligation. It's lawful to do that which is good on the Sabbath, but it's a day of rest. And I rest because he rested, because he and he alone is my God. And I won't obey another voice. And nor should you. But Sunday is only one of the crumbs of Roman leaven left in the Protestant lump. The three most sanctified days in Christendom today are found only in paganism. They have virtually nothing to do with the gospel, nothing to do with Jesus Christ. They, too, are the traditions of men. I named the first one Sunday Sabbath. The next two most holy days in all of Christendom today are Christmas and Easter. And all you have to do is go go to any search engine and just Google the terms the origins of Christmas. And there you will find the mainstream Protestant denominations admitting to you that Christmas was practiced in ancient days by the pagans. What we call Christmas today was known as Saturnalia in the old pagan Roman Empire. And it goes all the way back, long before the birth of Christ. Santa Claus? <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. How could they deceive Christians about Sant- about about Christmas? Do you realize that in the Scriptures, God virtually dis- concealed the, the actual date of birth of our Christ? Went out of his way not to mention it. You can't prove by the Scripture what day Jesus Christ was born. So what is Christmas? All you have to do is look it up. If you are driven by the Spirit of God to return to true biblical Christianity, you will search out on your own 
what the true origins of Christmas today, and I recommend you do the same thing over Easter. Search out the origins of Easter, and you will be likewise shocked. And the Roman Catholic Church admits and boasts that it was she who introduced Sunday Sabbath by Constantine in 328 A.D., The Roman Catholic Church officially recognizes that what is known as Christianity today or Christmas today was celebrated by all the pagan sects before the the Christian era. And it was simply given a Christian name. It's paganism, pure and simple. Likewise, Easter. The celebration of the pagan Roman or the pagan Babylonian <clears throat> goddess Ishtar is the way it's it's spelled I S H T A R, but its correct pronunciation is Easter. And many of you will find this shocking, but I implore you, just do some 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 of your own research, and you'll find accredited Protestant. Authorities of every denomination admitting the pagan origin of all three of these most precious Christian traditions, Sunday, Christmas, and Easter. And, of course, if if I have to stop now and tell you about the pagan origins of of Halloween, I'll just be wasting my time. But yet they're practiced as a matter of religion, as a matter of worship of Jesus Christ to this day in Christianity. Never been repudiated. And I'm telling you those three holidays, four really, if you include Halloween, they're not holy. They're not holy days. They are diabolical traditions of pagans. And yet they're considered to be the most precious holy days in all of Christendom in every denomination, even in the Roman Catholic Church. And you can't explain that away. And you can't put false fire on God's altar. You can't mix the holy with the profane and ex- and expect God to receive it as worship. We must repent all the way. All the way. Come all the way out of the harlot of Rome. And her paganism, mark her and brand her for what she is. And we turn to the scriptures alone. Early on, the Protestant reformers would have had some excuse because they were just coming out of the darkness. The light blinded them. But we've had 500 years. 500 years. Don't you think it's time we sanctify ourselves, purify our house, and cast out the last remaining morsels of leaven out of our house? Christ is coming. What shall he find us doing when he returns? Worshiping him with pagan hands, pagan traditions, pagan songs, or worshiping him in spirit and truth? I intend to the best of my knowledge, to the best of my understanding of the Scriptures, the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit, to be worshiping Him in spirit and in truth when He returns. And I hope He finds not one spot of Roman leaven on my clothes. Continuing at the bottom of the page, 340, another quote. Here only is found the true food of the soul, said Martin Luther, familiar as he was with the writings of the philosophers and the schoolmen. Quote, here only, you, here only, you say, oh, if I could only hear, if, if I could only hear God. Listen then, oh man, my brother, God, the creator of heaven and earth is speaking to you, unquote. Obviously, he means from the scriptures. Do you want to hear the voice of God? Do you want to know that it is him speaking to you and not some demon 
in a robe of light? Some papacy deceiving you? Some demon who has transformed himself into the minister of righteousness like the papacy deceiving you? Do you want to know the creator and nobody else is teaching you? then ignore the philosophers and the schoolmans of quote-unquote Christianity and pick up the Bible and read it for yourself. God gave you eyes to see, gave you a heart that loves him. All you have to do is read his word and receive his love and his truth. And cast aside that, that hireling that lies to you every Sunday I think that if you will open that book and take off the church's glasses from off your face so that you can read the scriptures yourself, read what it says, not what has been erroneously preached to you, I think the light of liberation will come to your mind. You'll see like I do the errors that are taught in the churches today. That's where Satan resides, in the churches today. We have to come out of the churches. They're cooperating with Rome in this new world order. They're reversing the Protestant Reformation. They're rejecting Christ and returning to Antichrist. There's no fellowship in a Christian church today, not with Christ. As hideous as it is, it is reality. Satan has sought the very throne of God, and where would you find God's throne on this earth but in the Protestant churches? And he has kicked God out of his throne, and he's put his own pastor in the seat. A seminarian lied to from the day he registered to the day he got his license to preach the Word of God. Do you believe that? They have to have a license to preach God's Word? What authority do the, <clears throat> to what authority do they have to submit to get a license to preach God's Word? You've got to question anybody that would sign himself, sign his signature on a license to preach. You've got, to check, you've got to question the sanity of anybody who would sign their signature on a so-called license to preach God's Word. Right there's where you'll find Satan, right there behind the pulpit of your Protestant church, preaching you smooth things, Oh, yes, we're all going to go in the rapture even before the Antichrist shows up when the Antichrist has been here all along, tormenting God's people, crucifying God's people, burning them at the stake, burning their Bibles, burning their farms, confiscating their property, killing their babies. We've seen seen in history the prophecies of John the Revelator come to pass. Why do we look in the future for an antichrist that's been around all since the beginning of Christendom? The Protestant reformers were right. Martin Luther was right when he called the papacy the antichrist of the Bible. That's the historical view of Bible prophecy. It's the true view of Bible prophecy. Everything else is a laughable fraud. A laughable fraud. Continuing the first full paragraph on page 341, he says, The New Testament, once printed and published, did more to spread the revival of primitive Christianity, that is, true Bible Christianity, than all the other efforts of the Protestant Reformers. The translation was a splendid book. As a literary work, it charmed all classes. It was sold for so moderate a sum that all could procure it, And it soon established the Protestant Reformation on an immovable basis. Scores of editions were printed in an incredibly short period of time. 
The Old Testament from the same hand soon followed, and both were diffused through a population, familiar till then only with the unprofitable writings of the schoolmen of the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible was received with the utmost avidity. Quote, you have preached Christ to us, said the people to the Reformer. You enable us now to hear his own voice, unquote. In vain, Rome kindled her fires and burnt that book. It only increased the demand, and before long the papal theologians, finding it impossible to suppress Martin Luther's translation, were constrained to print a rival edition of their own. And this is where the Roman Catholic Bible comes from. It was simply a retort to the Protestant Reformation. Do you think maybe the popes who rewrote the Bible for Catholics might have made an error here and there? I will tell you, I've read on Inquisition Update the very account of the papacy's answer to 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 the Martin Luther translation of the Scriptures. The papacy, in order to early overthrow the Protestant Reformation, translated the Bible in such a way that it would uphold the divine right of the Pope to rule, not over just spiritual things, but over temporal things as well. And it was such a shipshod translation that it even embarrassed the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Remember, the Scriptures had now flooded Europe. Everybody had eaten that book like a ravenous wolf, filled to the brim with the Word of God. They knew what it said. They knew it by heart. They knew that it rejected the papacy as the Antichrist. The Roman Catholic Church to them was the synagogue of Satan, and they fled that church and clung to Christ like nobody's business. And when Rome answered with her ridiculous translation. Everybody recognized it as a fraud, and it was so overwhelmingly fraudulent, laughable in its attempt to overthrow the Protestant Reformation. They killed that pope and then recalled that Bible and burned as many of them as they could get their hands on so the Protestants would never read it and compare it with what Martin Luther had given them. It was an embarrassment to the Roman Catholic Church. It exposed the papacy as a diabolical fraud. It strengthened the Protestant Reformation. I've read that account. I understand what Martin Luther is speaking here right now. That the translation of Martin Luther so so empowered spiritually all of Europe and so reduced the papacy to rubble that the papacy, as a last-dish effort to save itself, had to make its own translation of the Bible to refute the Protestant Bible given to us by Martin Luther. And it was such an overwhelming fraud that it embarrassed the Roman Catholic Church to no end, and they made they spared no expense to recover every copy of that papal Bible to burn it and then come out with a more crafty, a more believable version of the Roman Catholic Bible that would not just fall to the ground immediately upon being read by Protestants. They never succeeded. They have never succeeded. Now the world is full of Roman translations. And none of them can compare to the King James Version of the Bible. The fraud is as plain as the nose on your face once studied. We still have the truth in our hands. But we need to read it, and we need to understand it, and we need to understand it in the light of the Protestant Reformation, in the light of history, and in the light and life of Christ who wrote it. And then we need to take action. 
the same action as was taken by the Protestant reformers. By this sword of the Spirit, Satan and his minions must flee. The New World Order could be destroyed without a shot. If God's people would have faith in Christ, faith in the Scriptures, faith in the truth, and have the fortitude to open their mouths and protest against the Antichrist and the, and the Roman Catholic Church. To protest against the papal governments that make slaves of us all. Expose the papacy and her control of our government, and Rome will flee, and so will her minions. Cast the Jesuits out of this country. Close the Roman Catholic seminaries. Put Christ back on his throne and put a true Bible-believing Protestant preacher behind every pulpit. Then you'll have liberty. Then you'll have truth. Then you'll have light and you'll have life. If not, you'll have Roman tyranny. We've already tasted Rome's tyranny. We don't like it. But before long, The burning begins. The tortures begin. The forcible conversions to Roman Catholicism begin. And it will be our own government sponsoring it. Rome has returned to her old ways in using the civil governments to overthrow and persecute and kill God's people for no other reason than to silence the truth, to silence the gospel that Martin Luther and the Reformers gave us. Now, at the bottom of page 341, he says, Once the Bible was thus read in the households of Christendom, the great change could not be averted. A new life, new thoughts, new standards, a new courage sprang up. God's own words were heard at the firesides of the people, and the power of the priest was gone. Quote, the effect produced was immense. The Christianity of the primitive church brought forth by the publication of the Holy Scriptures from the oblivion into which it had fallen for ages what was thus presented to the eyes of the nation, and this was sufficient to justify the attacks which had been made upon Rome. The humblest individuals, provided they knew the German alphabet, even women and mechanics, that is, the normal lower working-class people, read the New Testament with avidity. Carrying it about with them, soon they knew it by heart, while its pages gave full demonstration of the perfect accordance between the Reformation of Luther and the Revelation of God, the book of Revelation. It was the same in France. Imagine, Roman Catholic France was liberated by the gospel. It says it was the same in France. In 1522, a translation of the four gospels was published in France, by one by the name of Lefebvre, and soon after the whole New Testament. Then followed a version of the Psalms. In France, just as in Germany, the effect was immense. Both the learned and noble and the common people were moved. Quote, in many, says the chronicler of the 16th century, was engendered so ardent a desire to know the way of salvation that artisans, carters, spinners, and combers, that is, those people that that raise sheep and harvest wool, carters, spinners, and combers, that's what you do to wool, okay? We're talking about the average working-class Frenchman. It says... Uh, the the in, the uh, 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 the engenderment was so ardent a desire to know the way of salvation that artisans, carters, spinners, and combers employed themselves 
while engaged in manual labor in conversing on the Word of God and deriving comfort from it. Deriving comfort from it. Why? Because they were going to be liberated by it. They loved the Bible so much that they discussed the Scriptures at work while they were combing their their wool. It's always the little people, the common people, once they've received the gospel of Jesus Christ in their hands and read it for themselves. They are the ones who are first comforted. And then what falls after that? The papacy and the governments that rule over them. And it says, in particular, Sundays and festivals were employed in reading the scriptures and inquiring about the goodwill of the Lord, unquote. The pious Bisconet, uh, 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 Brykenet Bishop of Mao, sent a copy of the gospel to the sister of King Francis I, urging her to present it to her brother, quote, this from your hands, added he, cannot, be, uh, uh, cannot but be agreeable. It is a royal dish, continued the good bishop, nourishing without corruption and curing all diseases. The more we taste it, the more we hunger for it, with uncloying and unsatiable appetite, unquote. Quoting further, the gospel, said Lefebvre in his old age, is already gaining the hearts of all the grandees and people and soon diffusing itself over all France. It will everywhere bring down the inventions of men, unquote. What are these inventions of men? The papacy, the priests, the mass, and all of Roman Catholic tradition. It all crumbles in on its own foundation once the truth is known. It happened in France just like it happened in Protestant Germany. And when the dominoes began to fall, nearly all of Europe was liberated from papal tyranny. That's the power of the scripture. That's the power of the gospel. Do you want liberty? We've already been given it. All we have to do is take it out of its scabbard and swing it. He said the old doctor had become animated. His eyes, which had grown dim, sparkled. His trembling voice was again full-toned. It was like old Simeon thanking the Lord for having seen his salvation. You know, we ought to all stop and read again the account of Simeon. Old in age and faint in his eyes, led by the Holy Spirit to go to the temple and wait on the steps of the temple because the Messiah was coming by the arms of his mother to be circumcised on the eighth day of his life. Simeon, led by the Holy Spirit, that is, by the Scriptures, understanding from the scriptures the t- <clears throat> understanding from the scriptures the time of Israel's visitation he understood the prophecies of Daniel and he was waiting on the steps of the temple on the eighth day of Christ's birth when Mary and Joseph would come to bring him to be circumcised by the priest according to the law And he said, now mine eyes have seen the salvation of Israel. Would to God that we understood Daniel's prophecies. Would to God that we understood the preview of the Protestant Reformation, even in the New Testament. We've seen with our own eyes the salvation of God's people. How could we return to Antichrist? 
He continues, he says, Farrell, the French reformer, maintained the sole sufficiency of the word of God as the rule of faith and the duty of returning to its use. In the great Protestant confession of Oxford, it is a simple reference to Scripture that the new doctrines of the Reformation are justified. The Bible justifies itself. No one else can justify the Bible but the Scriptures itself. He says, from first to last, from its incipient germ in the soul of Martin Luther to the crowning day of the Reformation, the Bible was the very heart and core of the movement. Did you hear that? The very heart and core of the Protestant Reformation was the, was the Bible. And Protestantism has since deluged the world with Bibles. Do you wonder then that prophecy makes the giving of, quote, a little book open, unquote, to the representative of the church at that time, a leading feature of its prefiguration? That's right. In the, in, the God, in, the, in the New Testament, the Protestant Reformation is seen. And it prefigures the Protestant Reformation. And what horrors do we face today if the Protestant Reformation gives us, or, or rather, if the New Testament gives us a foreview of the Protestant Reformation, a prophetic foreview of the Protestant Reformation, what horrors lie in wait for us today if we reject the Protestant Reformation and return to popery? I'll let the Spirit of God answer that question for you. It's already been answered for me. I'm returning to the gospel. I'm returning to true Bible Protestantism, cost what it may. That's all I have for, day, for today. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior, we're total loss.